Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today's lesson is on the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. This was a hypothesis that was first proposed in 1941 by two scientists whose names were Beetle and Tatum. And they had this idea that each gene in the genome coded for an individual enzyme. And specifically that each one of these genes that coded for each individual enzyme and each individual enzyme thus impacted a specific step in a metabolic pathway. What do we mean by a metabolic pathway? Well, for example, the synthesis of the amino acid arginine in cells is a stepwise process where you start with a precursor and then this precursor is transformed into other things, one after the other, until arginine is eventually synthesized by the cell. And so Beetle and Tatum had this idea that there would be a gene that coded for an enzyme, and that that enzyme would catalyze one step in this process, and that another gene would code for another enzyme that catalyzed another step, and another gene would code for another enzyme that catalyzed another step, and so on and so forth. And they were correct in that these kinds of genes and metabolic pathways certainly do exist and are very important to cellular function. And their idea that one gene contributes to metabolic pathways in this manner through this one gene, one enzyme interface was a major contribution to the field of early molecular genetics. However, we now understand it to be kind of an oversimplification. And we know that the, the real... Uh, processes in the cell are much more complicated. So for example, we now know that many genes encode non-enzyme proteins. So for example, proteins like insulin, which is a signaling hormone that helps to regulate blood sugar, or Proteins like keratin, which is a structural protein that gives strength to hair and skin and nails. Or transport proteins, like for example hemoglobin, which is a protein in red blood cells that helps to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, between the lungs and the tissues. And also proteins like antibodies, which are important in immunity and, and helping us to fight off pathogens. So these are all examples of proteins, which are coded for by genes, but which are not actually enzymes, um, which is, which is a, a certain major exception to this one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. Another major exception is that many proteins are actually composed of more than one polypeptide. and that each of these polypeptides is coded by a separate gene. So actually, all of the proteins that I mentioned up here, from insulin to keratin to hemoglobin to antibodies, these are all composed of at least two polypeptides, if not three or four. And each of these is coded by a separate gene. And so this um, gives us a, a different way of looking at this original hypothesis, knowing that each gene can code for different polypeptides, but that the final proteins will contain components coded for by many genes. It's also true that there are many genes that code for various types of non-coding RNAs. What do I mean when I say non-coding? Well, we typically think that a gene codes for a protein in that the gene is transcribed in the process of transcription to make an mRNA transcript. And that mRNA transcript is then translated, protein is made on a ribosome during the process of translation. So that is that pathway for gene expression in the cell. But there are certainly many genes that code for various types of non-coding RNAs. So for example, genes that code for rRNA, which are the catalytic portion of the ribosome, genes that code for tRNAs, which are the transfer RNAs that bring amino acids to the ribosome during that process of translation that I just mentioned. There's also a whole host of regulatory RNAs, many, many different kinds, microRNAs, small interfering RNAs, long non-coding RNAs, and more than I can possibly mention here. 
and they have a wide variety of regulatory functions in the cell, and they're very, very critical to cellular function. If you're interested in learning more about these different types of regulatory RNAs, please see my video on that topic. Another exception to the original one gene, one enzyme hypothesis by Beadle and Tatum is that many multi-exonic genes produce transcripts that are alternatively spliced. What does this mean? Well, multi-exonic means a gene that when it's transcribed into an mRNA, there are more than one exon there. Uh, and these different exons can be joined together or spliced out in differential patterns through a process of alternative splicing, which means that from one gene that creates one mRNA transcript, many different proteins can result. If you're interested in learning more about alternative splicing and how that increases protein diversity in the cell, then please see my video on alternative splicing. But that is it for today and our discussion of the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. Thanks for watching Biology Professor.